We're filming today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. My name is Monk Rowe, and it's my pleasure to have Tom Baker as my guest here in Chautauqua, New York. Welcome. Thanks, Monk. World traveler. And uh, how long have you been coming back and forth from Australia? Well, I started, well, I, I, I was born in California. Mm -hmm. And I moved down there when I was about 19 with my family. And that was 1972. And a few years later, I started coming back and forth because my parents, they moved back to the States. And I stayed playing oh. in jazz bands. And how old were you then? Uh, ni 19. 19 or oh, 20. You, okay, did you start playing pretty soon when you got there, pretty quickly? Yeah, almost right away. The, the thing was, I, I was enrolled in a conservatory here in Stockton, California, called the University of the Pacific, whose main claim to fame was the day Brubeck went there. Uh, so after going there for six months, after junior college, the parents announced one day uh, to my brother and I that we were going to emigrate to Australia. I said, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> and a few months later, they, there we went. We'd sold the farm. We had a farm, you know, milk cows and all that. We sold the farm, and down we went. And none of us had ever been there. What was the reason for it? Well, my father had been in the, in the Marine Corps, and he'd sailed over from a long time ago in the 30s, apparently. He went to Shanghai in, in some kind of, not the Boxer Rebellion, maybe it was. One of those 1930s things where the Marines had to go to China to quell mm -hmm. some kind of rebellion. But he sailed in a ship from San Francisco to Shanghai, and he really loved sailing, even though he was probably down in, you know, in the bottom. And he wanted to build a sailboat. That was his dream. And build it in Australia and sail back to America. That was a big thing. That sounds like something you read about in a National Geographic, you know. Yeah. Well, it never happened. His, his health got bad and we, we couldn't finish the boat for one reason and, or another. And after a couple of years, the rest of my family moved back mm -hmm. to California, which is just as well because I don't really like sailing. <laughs> you know? <laughs> a long trip. I mean, how would you be on, yeah, from Sydney to Santa Barbara through everything, through the, the, the Suez Canal and the Mediterranean and across the Pacific and across the Atlantic and, and then through the Gulf of Mexico. And I can, I can only sail for two or three hours and you start, you know, you've had all the sandwiches and you've <laughs> kind of done the sails a few times and you think, well, gee, I wish I was on, on the land again where I could yeah. go, and, go and play. So anyway, that's how I got, yeah. got down to Sydney and why I stayed. Was there something in your childhood, in your family situation that attracted you to jazz music? Very late in life, uh, I was we had a piano in the family. It was my brother, myself, my mother and father. That's all there was in a country house on a farm in central California. That gives you the setting. Mm. No musical influences at all. There's no bands apart from the high school band. Uh, my parents listened to the usual run-of-the-mill, middle-of-the-road, Tijuana Brass, Roger, R Roger Miller, uh, Al Hurt, the, you know, the usual things that people had in their record collections in those days. Hugo Winterhalter. Yes. I remember him. Uh, Little Montavani, perhaps? Montavani was there. Yep. Uh, and we had a piano, and I was, I, I was made to take piano lessons, but I really loved playing piano, so I took piano lessons from a, an early age, uh, classical piano, from about age five for a few years. And after that, really got into other things. And then in, in high school, took up the trumpet. And I really didn't, I hadn't heard any jazz at all until one day, it was actually a day when there was a parade. It was called the, the Fate in the middle of our little town in California, which was called Escalon. There was a parade going by. And I remember there were two bands. They were both on the backs of trucks. And the first one was a rock band with fairly long hair. It yeah. wasn't that long, but it was pretty <laughs> long. And they had guitars and electric bass and a generator on the back. And blah, 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 blah. And I remember not liking it very much. And then a, later, a bit later on, after the, the scouts had walked by, there was a jazz band on the truck with a trombone player sitting in the on back. On the tailgate. Yeah, yeah. with a tailgate right. and a piano. <laughs> I thought, wow, this is it. Now, that's the one I want to do. I want to I do what they do. And that was my first uh -huh. taste of jazz of any kind. But it really wasn't until I got to Australia that I started playing any. Mm -hmm. 
But how did you, um, <clears throat> what was the next instrument after the piano? It was uh, the, the trumpet. Uh -huh. And that was in high school. Uh, about, well, what do you have, four years in high school. The third, no, the fourth year I got in, I bought a trumpet or a cornet and got into the band. I'd been in the choir for four years, so I had ear training and I could read music. Mm -hmm. And I knew, you know, where I was supposed to be in the choir and all that. But uh, the, playing the trumpet in the band was a lot of fun, especially marching. So I love marching in bands on the street. And Sousa marches and around the town, uh -huh. you know, on the football field. That was a lot of fun. And uh, then when I, when I got into college, into junior college, <clears throat> my parents decided that I, my teeth stuck out too much like a beaver, so I had to, I had to have braces on my teeth, mm -hmm. which is, I don't know, have you ever tried playing trumpet with braces on your teeth? No, but my daughter <clears throat> has. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's awful, really. So I had to go on to euphonium, which had a bigger mouthpiece. Yeah. And for a couple of years, I went off the trumpet. And then, about that time, we moved to Australia, and the braces come off. So I start playing the real stuff. Is it a trick to go from one to the <clears throat> other, physically? Not mm -hmm. for me, no. not now. Now, playing, playing more than one instrument, my first other instrument besides the trumpet was, this, was the tuba. And I remember being in a band one night where the trombone player was doubling on sousaphone or tuba. And when he, when he went onto the trombone, nobody was playing the tuba. And I thought, well, I asked the leader, is it OK? Can I try this? And he said, yeah, because it's just like a trumpet. Uh -huh. You blow in it, it's got three valves. And at first, it was a little weird, but it took you know, a couple of songs. And then I learned, you've got to relax your mouth. And then I got the notes. Yeah. And it wasn't that hard. So the tuba, that was the next one. And if we're talking about some sort of chronology, the next instrument was the saxophone. And uh, I, I was in England touring around, and, and I was playing away, and I felt this pain down here. And it was, a, it was actually a hernia starting. And it, it got a little bit worse. And I, mm -hmm. when I got back to Australia, they said, oh, you'll have to have it operated on. So I did, and for two or three months after that, it was really impossible to play the trumpet. It mm -hmm. hurt. Too much, <clears throat> too much oomph down here, too much pressure. Yeah, well, well hernias as well as uh, other things are, are congenital. In other words, you inherit them from your parents. And my father had hernias too, and so does my brothers. And So now I've had two hernias, and mm -hmm. it just happened to happen while I was playing the trumpet. But while, while they're knitting up, while you've got the stitches there, uh, you know, you really don't, you don't want to have any comedians around the house. You don't have any of your <laughs> usual guys that come around tell you jokes because you don't want to laugh. Uh -huh. And you don't, you're careful not to cough or anything else. And playing the trumpet was definitely out. Yeah. But saxophone, you could play a little bit in the end, blow, and work the fingers. So while I was convalescing, I learned, I learned the saxophone. Just went out and picked up a saxophone and... Yeah, a friend of mine was going overseas and... I said, leave it with me, and I want to. I'll have a go, and I got to play something while I'm gone, or while you're gone. Uh, well, <laughs> you definitely have some musical genes in your blood. I mean, uh, being at this festival, the first night I heard you playing the trumpet. Last night, and let's see, this afternoon, I heard you playing tenor sax. Later on in the day, I heard you playing alto sax, mm. and you seem to wail on all of them. Do you have a favorite? No. No. It's, it all depends on the mood and uh, what kind of band it is. Uh huh. Really, if it's uh, that kind of band, like the last one where I was playing alto, I wouldn't have wanted to play anything but alto because there mm -hmm. was already four piece front line. There was trumpet, clarinet, trombone, and tenor. So for me to double on any of those would have, would have been, uh, you know, not as not as fun as playing the alto mm -hmm. and, and trying to fit in, trying to play something that didn't, didn't get in their way because yeah. really, you know, five-piece front line is, is very difficult. But some bands, you know, you have to play the trumpet. Other bands, I want to play the clarinet. Trombone's my newest one. Yeah. And I'm, that's, I'm not there yet, but I'm, I'm working hard on it. But it just depends on the band and uh -huh. the mood. Really? When I heard you play tenor, uh, it was interesting because you were 
four of you together. Yeah. And uh, you, in my ears, you were the most aggressive player there. Mm. Do you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, you had Scott Hamilton and uh, a couple other guys who mainstreamish players, I guess. I don't know. Labels are tough, but I almost could hear you playing in a rhythm and blues band, mm -hmm. too. I probably get, if I get hot at all, I get hot probably sooner, or because I'm not used to playing. Like Scott can play, he can go up in a very gradual incline and get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And at the end of it, you know, wow. I can't do that. I, I dive in with both feet and, and I, I really can only play two or three courses and then I, I run out of ideas. It, mm -hmm. It's just, I need to, need to do it more or something or listen to Scott. But Harry Allen's great. He can, he can start slow and then expand and then you think he's, he's going to stop and then he expands a bit more. Uh -huh. and, uh, and Scott Robinson, I've never met Scott. I've never met Harry either. I've heard on, on record, but I've never met Scott. And uh, he plays his most amazing eclectic things. He sure does. Doesn't he? Yes. You know, up high and down low, perfect command of all the instruments, and he's standing with his deadpan look. Yeah. What's he going to do now? <laughs> his lovely tone. He's completely in command of what he's doing. Yeah. And, and, and it doesn't sound like anyone else either. So. What kind of music did you listen to when you got into your teens? Did you get into jazz recordings? No, not at all until uh, until college. Uh -huh. The first jazz I, apart from this band that came by on the truck, I think they were playing the Saints. Something that, the very first jazz I heard was uh, Turk Murphy's band on the radio from the University of the Pacific radio station. And shortly after that, I, the family emigrated to Sydney. Um, and I started looking around for jazz, uh, starting to collect 78s. And I got a, a job in a music store, which was good. The, the whole idea was for me to go to a, we were going to settle in a city. We could build a boat anywhere, going back to the boat. We could build a boat anywhere, but we were going to go to a city where I could get into a, a conservatory and finish my degree. And that was, it was a good theory, except we, we wrote to all of them. The only one that wrote back was the Sydney one. And they said, yeah, well, we'll have a look at him. So when I got there, they, they asked me questions like, well, what syllabus have you been studying? And I said, what's a syllabus? <laughs> and they said, oh, well, what grade have you achieved? What do you mean, what grade? <laughs> they ask me all these questions because the whole thing's built on the English system of grades, and the syllabus means the program, and, and what piece have you prepared? And I haven't prepared any piece. So I didn't fit in at all. And I left, I left the, the conservatorium, or the con, as we call it there, and got a job at a music store. And I, I got posted to the jazz department, and all of a sudden I was able to check out records every night. <laughs> like two and three LPs, this was required that you take home records oh, and listen to them. <laughs> Yeah, it was fantastic. So I took home everything, everything in the in the whole section, and taped everything. You weren't supposed to tape it. Yeah. But I taped it, of course, and brought it back the next day. So I had this vast collection of all these different things, and learned a lot mm -hmm. at that time. What was the music scene like in Australia? In this, you said this was seventy, early seventies. Seventy-two, seventy-three. Yeah. A pretty uh, healthy pop scene over there? Yeah, a healthy pop scene, though we didn't have anything to do with the pop scene at all. Though uh, they still had black and white TV then. Mm -hmm. They didn't get color until about 74, just by the, by the way. Uh, but they did have their, their own pop idols, which were a bit like the American ones. They had a small amateur or semi semi pro jazz scene and i remember the the salary the, the money we used to get on a saturday night was seven dollars and that that went on for about two years and then we got a rise or raise mm -hmm. to eight went up a dollar and in a jazz club you're talking about bars and bars pubs, yeah real pubs you know they they open at eight in the morning they close at eight at night and you know there's fights and stuff and there weren't jazz clubs as such like they are here. Yeah. 
but they had they had a jazz club, like a real club with mm -hmm. members, and and they'd have meetings once a month. Uh, and there was a professional scene where guys would you know, make studio recordings for commercials and jingles. Mm -hmm. But I never got into that until a little lot, lot later. Was it an event when uh, an American jazz musician would come to town? Big event. I can remember when uh, the first concert I went to was, uh, I mixed the, the, there were three concerts and I mixed them up because they would happen so close together, but it was, I remember it was Earl Hines and Bobby Hackett and Wild Bill Davison and John Faddis, I think. Could Would he be. Be, have been around in 72? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, John Faddis and, gee, who else? Benny Goodman, Zoot Sims. There was one promoter that brought packages out. And just before I'd gotten there, there was another package. It was New Orleans versus Bebop. Or something, you know, one of those jazz war things where they brought <laughs> yeah. out the, the Thelonious Monk band, and Monk was so out of it he kind of didn't play for a few weeks, and George Lewis's band as well. Wow! And they toured together, and they'd appear on the same stage, uh -huh. so you'd get you'd get people from both camps coming along, and you know, sitting in different parts of the auditorium <laughs> and booing the <laughs> booing the boppers. And whose side are you on? <laughs> oh yeah! Oh, you wouldn't speak to the other side. Oh. You'd know. <laughs> By the way you were dressed or, you know, what you were drinking or something. It was crazy. But yeah, the, 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 any, any Americans that came to town, the Buddy Rich Big Band, uh, Gary Burton came over, and uh, wow, the Basie Band came over once or twice. But of course, because Australia is so far away, but because it's so far away, the, uh, if if musicians did a, a tour of Japan, sometimes they'd like go south mm -hmm. and include Australia and New Zealand in their package. So yeah. we, we saw a fair bit of you know, good talent, but n not as much as I liked. So did you get to a point where you found a few players on record that you really liked <clears throat> and that you tried to emulate them? Or were you pretty mm -hmm. much... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like who? Well, on different instruments, on trumpet, I wanted to be, I wanted to be Wingy Manone for a long time, you know, one arm. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you, you know, didn't was, take up that part of it. No, no, I <laughs> started riding cable cars, you know, kind of <laughs> kidding myself and get a cut off a play better. <laughs> but yeah, Wingy Manone was a hero, trumpet player, and of course Louis Armstrong. I remember when I first got to Sydney playing in a jazz band. I hadn't heard Louis Armstrong. I'd seen him on a, on something like the Dean Martin show, very late appearance in maybe 71 or 70, yeah. just before he died. And he didn't play. He just sang a bit of Mame or Cabaret or Hello Dolly or one of those things. And I thought, oh, that's Louis Armstrong? Oh, well, mm. okay. Mm. And so at the time, my hero was Al Hurt. I remember <laughs> a, a kind of dud banjo player who was the, the band leader turned around after a couple of nights and said, well, why don't you, why don't you start listening to Louis Armstrong and get off Al Hurt? <laughs> so I've heard Louis, you know, he can't play. I said, look, you better get wise, you know, listen to some of the right stuff. I said, well, maybe he's got something. And somebody else started, you know, laid the, the all-stars on me in the hot five. And, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Of course, they, everybody I listened to was, a, was an influence. Benny Carter on alto and Hodges and... Charlie Parker and Lester Young on tenor and Chew Berry and Hawkins. And now all the guys on trombone. And Pee Wee Russell on clarinet. And yeah, take something from everybody, I mm -hmm. suppose. So do you work now, I hope this isn't an obvious question, do you work full time as a musician? Yeah. As a performer? Yeah. Yeah. And does it, uh, is there enough gigs in Australia that you can pretty much do all right? More than enough. No kidding. Yeah, there's lots. I could, I could work more than I am Be because uh, playing all the instruments, I get calls from yeah. more, more bands than like call guys that just play one horn. And plus, I lead two bands of my own, and I'm in a big band. And uh, It's a good thing, Bob Bernard, because Bob's the, you know, he's the king in Australia. He's, uh -huh. the, you know, he's the man. He's out of the country a lot. 
<laughs> which is good for me. So when they want, when they want, they can't get Bob. They ring me, and so I'm I'm there a lot of the time. Uh -huh. uh, and I, you know, we all we all do festivals in Melbourne and Adelaide, interstate things. Yeah, uh, for pretty good money. So yeah, there's there's a lot going. Australia's a very uh, there's a lot of distances between places with not much in between them. Is that mm. a fair statement? Oh, yeah. Well, the nearest big city to Sydney is, uh, is about 14 hours drive. And you've, you've got some smaller ones in, in between. Then the next one after that is 20 hours drive. Then the next one after that is, well, that's Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, and then it's, it's two days drive to Perth, which is the most remote city in the world. But yeah, the, the, the population now, I think, is about 15 million, which is really, it's not that many. That's not that much. But in the center, there's basically not much. It's, it's real hot in most of the center. And where the rain is on the East Coast, where, where things grow, and where people traditionally settled, and where they had the convict settlements in the old days, that's Sydney, Melbourne, and, all, and Adelaide, where mm -hmm. the wine is, all around that, that southeastern coast. The northern part of it is, is too hot, and it's rainy, and Darwin's up there. And we always say Darwin's got uh, alcoholics unanimous. Oh, yeah. Because there's really nothing to do with drinking and, and, and make money up there. So people go up for either one or the other. I've mm -hmm. never been there, so I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's one of the Sydney sayings. But in the, in the middle, really, it's... It's basically nothing much. Little yeah. towns and you know, towns in the desert with golf courses that, that don't have any grass. <laughs> it's just sand. Well, you have golfers. You have the sand wedge. Yeah, the, uh, sand wedge. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's right. What do you think of, uh, did you miss uh, much of America when you went to Australia? Yeah, for a long time I missed pine trees. Because mm -hmm. I was a, a scout, you know. I mentioned the scouts marching yeah. by in the parade. Yeah. I actually got up to be an Eagle Scout, mm -hmm. you know, like a. So we went on lots of hikes, and I spent a lot of time in the woods up around Lake Tahoe. And I love the forest. And in, in Australia, they only have gum trees, you know, eucalyptus, yeah. which are different. They're kind of scraggly trees. And I, I miss the pine trees a lot, but. And I still do a bit. And some of the food that you can get in America, like French's mustard, they don't have that down there. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, it's true. You get used to certain things when you're growing yeah. up here. There's not much else. I hear you're quite a chef. Yeah, I'm an amateur chef. Yeah. Started when I was on the road, and the only food you could get was pretty third rate. So I started cooking for myself and guys in the band in the in the motel rooms. You know, you drive up to a motel and the, the guy'd come out and he'd give you he'd always give you the, the coffee and the milk so you could make your own tea in the yeah. room. They, the first thing they do is they give you the key and the and the little jug of milk. No kidding. Yeah. Oh. When you check in. And he'd saw all the pots and pans, he said, Oh, you're not gonna cook in there? I said, No. No, of course not. So we go straight into the you know, we always cook in the bathroom where it was tiles and they have like an air thing. <laughs> and you make steaks and everything and Guys would come in and eat it. And I learned to cook in, in the motels. Uh -huh. But I, I like cooking all, all sorts of things, Indian food. And it's fun cooking Mexican food for people that have never had it. I mean, it's mm -hmm. different here, where they're real connoisseurs. But over in Australia, they, they, they talk about going out and having tacos. Because <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they don't know how to pronounce it. So it's kind of fun. It must be hard to get some of the ingredients for some of that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it is. You have to really look. But Sydney's pretty cosmopolitan. Yeah, and there's there's a little pocket of Americans who who've had a business selling, for instance, Mexican supplies uh -huh. for a long time. There's four million people now in, in Sydney. Yeah, and they're having the Olympics in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. So all the band leaders are. are thinking about, you know, what are we going to charge New Year's Eve in the year 2000 with the Olympics there? 
you know, will we start at $2,000 and, and go up? <laughs> you, take, <laughs> you think about these things. You take scale and multiply it by, by let's see. Yeah. 20. Just add on some knots, one after the other. <laughs> Is there um, a strong musicians union in Australia? Now, there used to be, but mm -hmm. not anymore. Yeah, I, it's kind of like here. I've heard. Yeah, what, what were you going to say? Well, the musicians union is certainly not what it used to be. In, mm. the, in the big cities, that's still pretty powerful, but it has very little control over things that it used to, like what clubs will pay and all that mm. kind of thing. Now it's mostly entrenched and still in the symphony orchestras and TV and movies. Yeah, guys that have really regular year-to-year right. -year employment with contracts. Right. Yeah, it's the same down there, too. You, you really get paid what you're worth in the jazz scene. In mm -hmm. other words, if, if the people will come to hear you, you'll get the job, and you'll get paid a commensurate fee. Uh, the, the state of jazz in Australia, what's the most contemporary thing that's going on? It's a pretty much a f follow what goes on in the States. I think so. The, the jazz education program there has a, a large bearing on the, uh, the types of young people that come out, that, start, that come out from, they, they go from high school to, say, the, uh, the music programs in the, in the colleges and then out into the, into the jazz workforce, if you like. And I think the, uh, the way they teach jazz here is, is pretty much similar. In the, in the colleges here, it's, it's pretty much similar to the way they do it over there. And I don't, I don't really think it's a good thing because they, the way they teach is, I don't really know what to say about that. But I've met a lot of guys, a lot of young guys that have come up through jazz education courses and learned, you know, been in there for two or three years, and they don't, they don't know the basics. They don't know Sweet Georgia Brown. They get embarrassed. They come sit in with a, a swing band, and you call Sweet Georgia Brown, and they, they don't know it. I'm, I'm just touching on like these sort of they're not, points here. They're not learning tunes. <clears throat> they're learning chords. They learn the modes. They yeah. learn the chords. Two five ones. They, they learn how to improvise. They, I think the teachers. It, it's not the student's fault, it's the teacher's fault. And the people that design the, the curriculum, the curricula, <laughs> don't know. The syllabi. The, the syllabi, there you go. <laughs> and uh, the, the teachers they get know what they know, and they pay a bit of lip service to the old masters. They go back maybe as far as Charlie Parker, and they might touch on the, the seminal influences before him, Louis Armstrong, Big Spider, Big. Lester Young and maybe Coleman Hawkins, and probably speak about ragtime or something. Mention the original Dixieland Jazz Band as being the first to record. But from what I gather from friends of mine who've gone through these courses, they really don't dwell on it enough. So the, the kids really don't have any idea. And they really get into the, the meat and potatoes of, of jazz after Parker like post-bebop, they really mm. start studying in the post-bebop era because that's where the teachers come from. That's what they know. And th these are the sort of players that you see come up. Most, until recently, most of the young players in Sydney have been out of this, this kind of uh, education system, this mold, and it's been the rare one that's been able to sidestep it. There's a few guys that don't want to do that or can't do it. And they end up being professionals in, in our sort of thing. They can play traditional jazz. Mm -hmm. Now, if they play the trombone, they know about Kid Ori, and they, they, learn, they learn the proper songs. And they, they don't try and play bebop over the wrong sorts of music. So it's a bit of a sore point with me, that. Uh, but I think the educational systems, getting back to your original question, are probably similar mm -hmm. to here. OK. Is there an integrated uh, jazz scene in Australia at all? How do you mean? I mean like black and white players, is it? There aren't any black players. Okay. The aboriginals, they're, they're there, but there's, as far as I know, there aren't any 
there's been an Aboriginal, a few Aboriginal tennis players, but they mm -hmm. they don't seem to be in, into jazz. There's there's quite a few country country and western singers and guitar mm -hmm. players, and and there's a guy that comes along where we play on a Friday night with the didgeridoo. Yes. <laughs> I was going to ask you when you might add that to your arsenal of music. Oh, that's <laughs> real hard. You, You've uh, got to circular breathe and all that. I can circular breathe already on the trumpet. Can you? It's, it's mind over matter, like learning to juggle uh -huh. three balls. Once you can do it, it's easy. But you just have to keep your lips, you have to keep air going while you close your throat and breathe through your nose. Um, you have to get somebody to show you, really, and then you'll know. But uh -huh. with the didgeridoo, the hole, it's not just a little hole like in the trumpet or a straw or something. The hole is that big. And you're, you're blowing a lot of air right through. And you have to breathe all that. It's continuous. Plus, you've got to buzz and make this sound. And they're doing all these things with their throat. And the most amazing sounds, uh -huh. animal sounds and and then a sounds of the forest and birds and stuff, all from this pipe. Yeah. Incredible. I've, I've heard of a fellow from Australia do it. Uh, he was Aborigine, and he went on for five, ten minutes. I was just enthralled with what... Did he play for He you? played amazingly, and he had titles for the, the songs for, like... One was about a truck <laughs> going right. down a highway in Australia and the things that it met. Oh, and yeah. as he did it, you could see, oh my God, he's doing the truck and it's going to run over this this animal here. Truck meets a kangaroo. Or yeah, it was, was just truck, was yeah. uncanny. That's good. Yeah. Uncanny. We, when we think of Australian music, we think of novelty songs like Timey Kangaroo Downsport. Right. Well, I happened to tour Japan with uh, this multi-instrumentalist, James Morrison. And uh, it, was, it, was the, it was the expo in Tokyo, and every country had a week to do their own thing, present their own music and their food. And uh, Rolf Harris was on the bill with us, along with Roger Woodward, the pianist, and opera stars, and a few other people. And uh, Rolf did, he did Timey Kangaroo Down, and he played the wobble board, mm -hmm. which is just a board, he <laughs> quite effective. <laughs> And he did this thing where he, we played Sakura, da 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 you know, the Japanese theme. Uh -huh. And he set out the front, and he'd do a watercolor, which was real good. And when we finished the tune, he finished the watercolor and signed it, and then proceeded to uh, give it to these people in the front uh, for charity. And they'd auction it off, and they'd get all this money. Wow. And he did this on every concert he f in Japan. He finished with a watercolor and gave it to charity. So I thought that was a good thing to do. But I asked him about Time Me Kangaroo Down, and he said, yeah, it was. Everybody thought that was the only Australian music mm -hmm. because it was the number one hit. Oh, he, well, there was also My Boomerang Won't Come Back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I've practiced till I was black in the face. Yeah. My Boomerang Won't, <laughs> won't come, come Back. back. <laughs> yeah, that, you can't even mention that the, these days. <laughs> <laughs> they never play that on the radio anymore. No, I guess not. Oh, it's politically very incorrect. Uh huh. But the Seekers, you know, they were Australian. Oh yeah. And we heard them on the radio. Uh -huh. We didn't know. No one ever said they were Australian. We thought they were English. Well, you have uh, you have stated that you have a mission, according to the program here, and this that's to keep the swing music alive of the '30s and '40s. Mm-hmm. And um, what is it about this music that, that can you put into words that makes you want to play it? It's just worth doing. Uh, a lot of times we just, we just keep playing and there's nothing particularly that inspires us to do it. It's a worthwhile, valid music, blah, blah, blah. But when it, when it swings, when it really comes together, it's better than anything, and I've, I've heard a little bit of that today, this morning. I mean, you were sitting at the table. Did, were you there when, the, yep. when they were playing? Those arrangements. Those arrangements. The yep. last song they played, I was watching Bob Haggard, and, and I want to go right out and learn the bass now. Yeah. I really do. Him and Hal Smith, they got together, and that's, that's as good as any jazz I've ever heard on a record. It has a pulse to it when it gets going, and yeah. man, with that, especially with that acoustic rhythm guitar chunking yep. away. Well, even wow. at its worst, it sounds good, but today it, it caught fire. You know, we, 
we, you can count on, on the fingers of both hands at my age the times when that happens. It, and it doesn't happen that often, even if you play every night of the week for years and years. The times when you can remember yourself rising up and thinking, this is jazz, this is why I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And today was one of those things. Was, yeah. My heart was, wow. <laughs> I wanted to yell. Ah. <laughs> I know, and it, it, it was a little strange to sit while that was happening like that and to look at the audience. And God bless them, they're, they support this music. But it seemed a little strange to just have everyone so still. It's not their fault. They can't dance. They've got yeah. to sit still. If they had a dance floor, right. they'd be up. They should have a dance floor. This is dance music. We're playing dance music to people who are listening. And, and basically, that it's, I don't want to say it's wrong, but it's what, it's, we're, what we're doing, it's, it's not concert music. Yeah, it's selling it short because that's what it was for, was it? I mean, God. Selling God it that, short, that's good. Got that chunk, chunk beat, and uh, I'm not even a dancer, but I just felt like getting up. Oh, me neither. And, and, and I know a lot of those people would. I know they would. Uh, the, a concert's good every now and then to keep, to keep you honest, and you, you, know, you know that everyone's listening. It's great. And you put on a tie. And, but if, from day to day playing, if, if they're not dancing, you're really not sure if they like it or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, we're pretty sure here that they like it yeah. because they're here and they show up, they keep showing up and they don't buzz off to some other place. They're there. But if, if people are dancing, you can tell. You can, you can create heat and make them dance harder, spin around, fall over yeah. and all that. Yeah. So th that's really what this music is supposed to do and we, we can't do it here in the other, the other jazz festivals. So I'd like to see them have a dance floor here. Uh -huh. Tell me about this nice CD. Um, that's, the, that's my latest one, uh -huh. recorded in Australia with uh, master cornet player Bob Bernard. And it's called The Man from the South, which is a, a tune taken from a Ted Weems recording from 1927. Uh, there's a picture of my car on the front. We're uh -huh. sitting on my car which is a 1953 Holden, a brand that will probably be unfamiliar to all the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably from expatriates. Um, is it a V8? No, it's a, it's a, it's a what they call a small six, uh -huh. which is as big as you got in those days. Yeah. Ford had a V8, but uh -huh. then it cost more. But this was built in Australia, and everyone was really proud of it. And you play trombone and cornet, and you do some vocal, mm -hmm. some tenor sax. Well, I look forward to hearing this. Yeah, there's a clarinet track, one clarinet or two. Clarinet track. Players. Sing a couple. Bob sings one or two. Uh, and you do some arrangements, too. Yep, and it's out on a label called La Brava, mm -hmm. which is run by the brother of my fiance. And distribution across Australia, I mean, is that the goal? It's kind of hard sometimes promoting yeah, your own I think records. It is. You sell more of them on the gig. Yeah. D David uh, tries his best to contact. He's got a, well, lots and lots of CDs to sell, and they're all really well done, et cetera, et cetera. But he tries to put them in record stores, and they, the mainstream record stores don't really want to know. Yeah. All the jazz record stores, they're fine. But if it's not the large selling things, they, mm -hmm. they might keep a couple of copies. And when those go, they don't bother reordering because they forget. So distribution's tough, Yeah, really tough. What's the most contemporary, uh, I don't want to use that word. Let me use a different word. What's the most? modern, chronologically, type of jazz you would care to play? Uh, gee, probably Charlie Parker style bebop. Yeah. That, that era, 40s bebop. And, and also I really like the, the cool school, the Art Pepper 
Paul Desmond, Jerry Mulligan stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe being a West Coast boy, I've got a affinity for that. But I really like that. But the, mm -hmm. the, the hard bop stuff I can't understand. Certainly the, 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 the modal thing from the 60s and all that free stuff, I, I, I can't say I don't like it, but I just, I can't do it. I've tried, but it, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so, can you can you think of the weirdest, toughest gig that you've ever played? Well, I can think of pretty some weird gigs. Uh, we, once, once a band, a band I took from Sydney up to a place we call the Gold Coast, which is it's a casino world up. Sydney and they have big American style casinos. A band of mine had trumpet, trombone, clarinet, banjo, piano, and washboard. It was supposed to be a kind of background good time band for a couple of nights. And when we got there, the, the, the man from the hotel said, uh, okay, the, uh, the acts will be coming along any minute with the charts. Uh and I thought, uh oh, <laughs> yeah. And so along came this, this, this guy who was straight out of Atlantic City or Vegas or something, and he, he had all these charts for things, you know, Pointer Sisters medleys and, and all this stuff. <laughs> and there was no other band, and he was booked, and we were booked, and nobody told him and nobody told us. And fortunately, the piano player and I both read music. No one else in the band did. <laughs> And this is washboard. We had washboard. There's no drums, and there's a drum chart this long I'm with so drum fills. I'm so excited! <laughs> yeah, can you imagine it? With the lights and all, and all that. So we did the show, and he left out the things that were impossible, <laughs> like things with with long drum fills. <laughs> so that's yeah, that's that's one of the weirdest ones. Yeah. We got through it, and he thanked us at the end. He said, "Look, I know you did your best." <laughs> We said, well, thanks for putting up with us. <laughs> we, we both split real quick to the bar and got it. <laughs> wow. Can the, is the life of a, a jazz musician these days, is it, um, is it a healthy lifestyle? Well, healthy in what way? Well, I'm just thinking about, you know, we were talking about the bebop era and so forth, and so many of those guys... Oh, you mean healthy drug-wise? Yeah. It's as healthy as you want it to be. I think it was always healthy. There were guys that, that did it all without drugs. Apparently mm -hmm. Clifford Brown, you know, did everything without, without being a junkie or without drinking a whole lot. Other guys just got on the bandwagon and did it, and they're guys now that that it's not so much heroin going around, certainly not in our scene. There's no, there's no junkies. There's a lot of alcoholics mm -hmm. and a lot of guys that smoke too much. But basically, it's a healthy scene. Yeah, yeah. good. Uh, we still work in places where they serve alcohol and places that are full of smoke. Apart from here at the jazz party where there's no smoke. Yeah. Um, so it's not all that healthy that way. You know, you're forced to breathe smoke. And you're not forced to drink alcohol, but it's there, and you tend to go with the flow. So yeah, it's healthy enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. I just want you to stay healthy now. Well, I'm going to try. You know, to carry all those instruments around. It's the worst thing about being a multi-instrumentalist. You've got to carry it. Yeah. Especially when you're coming from there to here and back, and tr planes and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I've got I've got one bag with my clothes and CDs, and then I've you've got an option. Of, you have to take no more than two bags. So the trombone is the bag number two, and then you've got to carry the others on your shoulders and do some fast explaining at the door about why you've got three cases that none of them fit in the little thing. And you say, well, please, my livelihood depends on this, and won't you put it in the uh, in the suit closet? And, they take pity on you, but you're always doing this. Yeah. So it helps if you wear a tie and look don't look <laughs> like a bum. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. And um, I wish you the best 
You traveling uh, straight back to Australia or here for a while? No, I'm, I'm actually going on the train on Monday with uh, Dan Barrett to New York, mm -hmm. and we're going to hang out, as they say. And we're, going to, we're meeting Bob Bernard on Tuesday night. Um, and then I have to fly to Europe for uh, two or three weeks' worth of gigs over there. I've been going to Europe every year for almost 20 years. Wow. Playing with Dutch bands. There's, there's a couple of bands that don't have trumpet players, Dixieland bands. Did you ever run into Spiegel Wilcox over there? I met him once, yeah. yeah. He lives not too far from us and still doing well at 93 or so. Where does he live? He lives in Cincinnati, New York, which is an hour and a half south of, it's right in the middle of New York State. Right. Got a beautiful home, cool guy. Yeah, how old is he now? Like in a 90 or something? Nin he's definitely over 90. Hmm. I wonder if he's as old as Benny Waters. I think Benny Waters is 94, and I think he's... 94? I think he's tops. Right. I'm doing a festival with Dan Barrett and some Dutchmen, actually, uh -huh. next March. That's the next time I'll be in the States. The Arbor's... Yes. Jazz party? We're thinking of going there. Yeah, in Florida. Yep. Clearwater... Yep. Bay, Clearwater yep. Beach. Y'all yeah, be there. We'll see you there. Good, good folks that run that thing, too. Mm, yeah. yeah, Matt Domber, the, the right. head of the records. I'm, I spoke to him on the phone. Sounds like a good cat. He is. All right. All right. Well, thanks for your time. Hope you have good music tonight. Thanks for having us, Monk. Okay.